Hello, everyone. This is Supreme Decisions, and you're listening to the Supreme Decisions Legal Minute Podcast. Now, I want to welcome everybody that's listening for the first time, and I want to welcome back everyone that has been listening since the inception. Today, I'm actually going to do something that has like a double meaning, because as you see the title, it's finished, the Love It episode. The reason I did that is because part of this podcast tonight is personal. Because it goes out to someone who I befriended, I've enjoyed conversation with, and also someone that is learning and perfecting their craft. This is also someone that's working towards a goal in which I feel the information I'm going to give tonight will continue them in that process. Now, you hear me talking about the Brady List. You hear me talking about detailed discoveries and things of that nature. But one of the things that most people miss is the fact that when we're doing this, What's the purpose behind it? Now, I told you the context of the Brady List itself. The Brady List is to actually start getting these bad police officers off the force because we have to put them in a point of uselessness because the actual patrol officer or officer that's on beat is the one that kind of... They're, they're our introduction to pretty much the legal system and nothing starts or changes until we force that change now where the fight actually starts is not necessarily once you get that contract which is the citation or or you're arrested or whatnot it actually begins that first court date because that's your arena that's the place to shine but here's the thing because I've been telling you for two years now. I'm going to set set up a point in which we're going to weaponize your defense. Because the context of the weaponization is to make sure you have the ability to defend yourself. I'm not just going to throw out a bunch of cases and tell you go have at it and not give you substance because remember i told you this is food this is this is the microwave stuff i'm giving you an entire meal so if you're hungry i hope that's why you're listening because if you're hungry i hope you got your drink ready your boy got his jack here if you got something that you need to roll up go ahead and do that before you start the rest of this podcast and if you need something else get your pen and paper ready Get your iPhones up. Get your Google Notes. Get all everything that you need to be prepared because knowledge is about to be dropped today. And for those, again, who are the naysayers, who the, the disbelievers, or I've actually found this to be quite humorous lately, those that need proving when they call me for help, those that have never done anything, but want to inform me of how something is done that I've done a thousand times and I've been successful at, I want you to pay attention and get focused. I want you to relax. Because what I'm about to, well, I, what, what did he say? I'm about to hit you with street knowledge. But the problem is I'm going to change that, your address on this street. Right? Because one of the things we actually have to deal with is understanding where the Brady List is aiming at, how I'm aiming it, how I'm weaponizing the Brady List. It's now to start using the context of the prosecutorial selection, or as most of us know it, is the prosecutorial discretion, the prosecutorial choice, the prosecutorial choosing. And this is one of the things because I had an interesting conversation earlier this week. And it was literally about Brady violations. 
And the guy went into the context of, well, there's not very many times that the Brady Brady violation has been um what was what do you use? I'm trying to figure out the word he used. Hasn't been pursued, let's put it that way. And I told him piranha don't eat piranha. He said, What do you mean? I said, here's the thing. I said, I work with two defense attorneys that have spoken on my podcast. He said, okay. I said, well, they have a bar card just like the prosecutor has a bar card. None of them have ever submitted a detailed discovery until I gave it to them to submit. Piranha don't eat piranha. Now, I'm going to start, I'm, a, I'm going to say something in just a few seconds that actually gets you to the point of what, why I say the detailed discovery. Because I told you in Georgia, there's literally a statute that said if you don't request it prior, you cannot bring it up on appeal. George is also the place that's executed knowingly three innocent men. I actually did that in my list of 106 and stopped. The 106 innocent people that we know we executed in our flawed system. Because we don't want to admit that we were wrong. But when you're talking about punishment, we're also talking about the idea of what a crime is and who's making up because everyone that's along this path is using discretion, which is free will. They're making a conscious choice. And the reason it's not fully prosecuted is because everybody has a bar card and no one wants to go against their teammate. Always remember, if you're listening to me, it's a good chance you're not on that team. It's a very good chance that you are not on that team. So you have no loyalties to that team because they are not going to show any to you. So now when we go back into Brady v. Maryland, 1963 case, it's still relevant today because there are aspects of it that are loosely applied when not used by, well, actually, let me, let me, let me rephrase that. I always tell people the idea of a, a decent attorney is $500 an hour. I always tell people the biggest thing is all cases, no matter what it is, requires a minimum of 100 hours. Now, if you multiply 500 times 100, you're going to get 50000 Why is that number so relevant? Because the $50,000 attorney is not eating from the state. So, therefore, they are not going along with the state. So always understand that that's the starting point. Because I even had a young man that called me and he actually had me speak to his attorney. When the attorney called me and I told him exactly what my plan was, the attorney laughed and she said, that's exactly what I had just told him. So when I called and spoke with his um, representative, we actually did have the exact same plan. But whenever I was giving him the price, he was dumbfounded. It was only because she knew he had another option that she lowered her price. Understand, I'm the God mode. I'm the cheat code when it comes to this. Not because I'm, I'm you know what, fuck it. I am the best at this. This is what I do. I don't play law. I live this. This is my actual life. I wake up doing law. I go to sleep doing law. I'm studying law on a daily basis. So when we're talking about what this is and how, excuse me, and how this is, understand I'm not doing this just because. I'm not saying something just because. I'm saying it because it works. I'm saying it because it applies. So now when we're talking about Brady v. Maryland, again, 1963, one of the things that we're going to evaluate, again, is the prosecutorial choice. And watch the direction that I'm going in. We now hold the suppression by the prosecution of evidence favorable to the accused upon request violates due process where the evidence is material either to guilt or to punishment irrespective of the good faith or bad faith of the prosecution. I'm going to repeat that one more time because most people didn't even catch that. Because 
whenever I tell you to do a detailed discovery, that's where the upon request comes in. Because also you're going to hear me say something again that I've been saying before. Because even the DA cannot determine what's exculpatory or not when it is exercised. I hope you're ready for that. Because remember, any right exercised must be done in writing. Just like any right that you are giving up must be given up in writing. Remember, specificity upon request. If you're doing a detailed discovery and you're listing everything that you want, guess what they now have to do? They have to answer why they are not turning over everything that you want. And they can't give you the answer. But again, these are not my words. Always understand that. United States v. Argus, A-G-U-R-S, 1976. When the prosecutor receives a specific and relevant request, the failure to make a response is sold in or, if ever, excusable. I'm going to say that one more time because the country accent gets in the way sometimes. When the prosecutor receives a specific, another word for detailed, and relevant request, which means the things that are you asking for that are part of your case, the failure to make a response is seldom or, if ever, excusable. Why? Because the prosecutor can't make the decision. But again, not my words. I'm going to get into it again. If the evidence is so clearly supportive of a claim of innocence that it gives the prosecutor notice of a duty to produce, that duty should equally arise even if no request is made. Because you remember I've always said when you're going through discovery, it must be turned over whether you ask for it or not. Because again, clearly, clearly established. United States v. Argus, 1976. 1976 was uh, 70, 47 years ago. That makes it clearly established because it's codified in every state's organic criminal code. I'm going to say that one more time because it's codified in every state's organic criminal code. But I'll get back into that because you remember I told you you can't argue with yourself. But here you go. Where previously undisclosed evidence revealed that the prosecutor introduced trial testimony that it knew or should have known was perjured. Now, I'm going to give you one from Argus and why that was read and why I kind of threw that one out there. I constantly tell you to get the police report. I also tell you to go and get applications. I also tell you to request video and audio because none of it ever matches. Why? Because they're not hiring intelligent people. I'm going to take a sip because I want you to think about that. Ah, that is good. Remember what I just said. They're not hiring intelligent people. So when you previously go through something and... It doesn't match the video because, you know, we see that a lot where you have a police officer using stock language. Why? Because they can't be specific. Remember that? They're giving language to use whenever they're filling out their police report. It's not going to be able to accurately describe the scene. They're not going to be able to accurately describe the incident. They're not going to be able to act. So basically what happens is at some point there becomes a discrepancy, which is called perjured testimony. And where previously undisclosed evidence, such as officer's jiggly information or disciplinary file, is not known but is then brought up at um, during trial, the testimony it should have known was perjured. The prosecutor is now liable for that. Whoops. 
because we get hung up on certain things such as Brady. We forget the context and the steps that apply to Brady. We forget about those things that go into the building of Brady. We forget about the setup to create the proof for Brady. And a conviction obtained by knowingly use of perjured testimony is fundamentally unfair and must be set aside if there is a reasonable likelihood that the false testimony could have affected the judgment of the jury. Now, I said this before. This is the Lovett episode. When we're going through trial transcripts, when we're going through evidence that was admitted and evidence that was not admitted, there are things that show up that create a conviction obtained by knowingly use of perjured testimony. It creates an opportunity where that conviction must be set aside if, remember the biggest words in law, if and or, if there's a reasonably likelihood that the false testimony could have affected the judgment of the jury. Now, we all know a lie don't care who tell it. And a prosecutor never wants to go to trial. Why? Because they lose. Because now they have to prove what you are thinking. And nobody can get into your head unless you allow them in. Now, how do we get another section of this? Generally, this is done after the case. And after the case, one of the things that was done, even in mine after the win, you know, October, tw uh, October 25th, 2012, 1.04 p.m., we polled the jury because there was a section in there in which my brother's attorney wanted us to take a lesser charge. And I honestly had to stand up and take sides with the, with the, um, with the prosecutor and say, no, nah, we're good. Leave it overcharged. I used the words overcharged, but that's not what the prosecutor said. But he wanted to leave it as is. I want to leave it overcharged because that's exactly what we were. We were overcharged for what we were doing. Anyway, but it was done through polling the jury. We found out there were certain judgments that would have been made had that been introduced. These are means of overturning, you know, those, those people that I tell you that are locked up to 63% that are released from death row because they polled the jury and found out perjured testimony was used. These are the things that we talked about because even now we're going into the context of the, attor the two attorneys down in Florida that are now not only being sued civilly, you know, like um, David Chauvin, who was already in federal court for four other um, use of force incidents prior to George Floyd, and then, you know, he, he he was sued civilly as well as criminally. These lawyers are also, um, have been criminally charged because they deliberately covered up evidence and charged this man with murder, and they used perjured testimony knowingly to send this man to prison for 30 years. So now this man is home. They are on trial for their lives right now. But anyway, I'm going to move on because I can do this all day. Anyway, Jiglio... U.S. because this is a 1972 case and this is where I talk about the Jiglio information of the police officer. It has been clear that deliberate deception of a court and jurors by the presentation of known false evidence is, inco is incompatible with the remunerary, God dang, the rudimentary demands of justice. Rudimentary, goodness. All right, let me take a sip so I can slow down a little bit. Ah, that, that's some good yak right there. Jiglio v. United States, 1972. It has been clear that deliberate deception of a court and jurors by the presentation of known false evidence is incompatible with the rudimentary demands of justice. I'm going to get into rudimentary because it's 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 not really a big word. It just sounds big. Now, in Powell v. Kansas, 
And it's a 1942 case, because I am I know I'm ready to hear it. Well, well, it's not even applicable now. And New P. B. Illinois, 1959. Because, again, this is why the Brady List exists and will continue. The same result obtained when the prosecutor although not soliciting false evidence, allows for it to go uncorrected when it appears, when the reliability of a given witness may well be determinative of the guilt or innocence of an accused, non-disclosure of evidence affecting credibility falls within the general rule discussed. Say that one more time because I know you're going to miss that. The same rules obtained... When the prosecutor, although not soliciting false evidence, you know, when they're getting a police report that doesn't match the video, allows it to go uncorrected when it appears. So whenever they introduce it or it's introduced into a trial, the reliability of a given witness may be determinative of the guilt or innocence of an accused. Now, we all know that the programming, again, the propaganda that was discussed at one point is real because most people believe a police officer is doing the right thing if they're talking to you. They're believing that this police officer is a good person if they're talking to you, but they also forget. They also forget that these police officers are human. They also forget that when we talk about someone becoming a police officer, it's never a good person that's becoming a police officer. It's somebody that nobody liked. It's somebody that used to get beat up all the time. It was someone that somebody actually got teased all the time. These are the people that we're talking about. So whenever their character or credibility falls into, we have to get to know their credibility too. This is why, again, where we talked about it, the upon request. I'm going to get deeper into that because I want you to understand because whenever you hear me refer to it, I refer to it literally as jiggly information. Because the prohibition against the use of perjured testimony remains available to the defendant as an alternative to Brady arguments. Because again, when we're looking, we're going through these police reports, when we're going through all these, what do you call it? What's the what's the one thing? The the police applications or the warrant applications. These are the things that we're looking for because even those inconsistencies are on sworn documents. Those are things that are submitted for not only one testimony, but it's two testimony because that's what an affidavit is. It's a testimony that is allowed before a judge. Uh oh, what what oh, what did I just say? Uh oh. The affidavit is what? It's testimony that is presented to a judge. I, I'm, oh, oh I, I might have said something. Let me take a sip of that yak because I'm going to let you let that sink in. Yeah, this is what I'm talking about. United States v. San Filippo. Due process is violated when the prosecutor, although not soliciting false evidence from a government witness, allows it to stand uncorrected when it appears. Two, where the government failed to accede to a defense request for disclosure of some specific kind of exculpatory evidence. Whoops, I'm going to give you one more before I go into the talk. Where the government failed to voluntarily... Turn over exculpatory evidence never requested or requested in a general way. Why did I stop there? Why did I hit you with the catch? Why did I even throw out the 1977 when we got Brady v. Maryland? Because again, remember I talked about the due process is violated. But I also talk about, because I'm going to say it again, when I talk about it, now you're getting ready to find out why I'm saying it. Because the prosecutor's responsible for 
even if they don't have it. Why? Because the prosecutor is making a conscious choice to prosecute. So now we talk about the lack of specificity coming from police officers or government agencies. I also talked about the government failing to volunteer exculpatory evidence never requested or requested in a general way. When you're talking about most defense attorneys, they're talking about requested in a general way. When you're talking about those that are less than $50,000, they're requesting in a general way. When we talk about the two defense attorneys that was on my podcast, they requested in a general way. When I offered them the opportunity to get a specific kind of exculpatory evidence, oh, uh oh, nobody wants to be on their team anymore because they're not playing by the same rules anymore. They're using tactics from the outside. They're using tactics that allow them to win. They're using tactics that allow them to have their clients go home. They're using tactics which makes the prosecutor work. They're using tactics which are making the prosecutor do their job right. They're also using tactics which allows them to hold the prosecutor responsible for the choices they're making. Well, I tell you, this jack is good tonight. Yep. I don't even know if it's going to make it through this podcast. But I want you to hang on to that. United States v. San Filippo, 1977. Due process is violated when the prosecutor, not soliciting false evidence from a government witness, allows it to stand uncorrected where that government failed to accede to a defense request for disclosure of some specific kind of ex exculpatory evidence, where the government failed to voluntarily turn over exculpatory evidence, never requested or requested in a general way. Because when suppression of the evidence would be of sufficient significance to result in the denial of a defendant, to its right to a fair trial. Why? Because due process is violated. When you're asking for something specific and the prosecutor refuses to turn it over. That was the one thing that was the hitch in my case. Because one of my biggest things is I always tell people, stay focused. Well, I need you to be focused. I need you to stay focused. The, because again, devil comes to bring chaos. The devil comes to distract. The devil comes to do everything else but allow you to stay focused. When you have the ability to sit calm and stay focused, you're forcing them to do what they want, they're not wanting to do. You're doing them a disservice by not allowing them to distract the jury. You're doing them a disservice because you're not allowing them to play with you. United States v. Bagley is a 1985 case, and it rejected distinction between cases where a specific request for exculpatory evidence was done and no request. Why? Because it gave you a standard. That standard, one, the prosecuting withheld or suppressed evidence. Two, the evidence was favorable to the defense. Three, the evidence was material to either guilt or punishment. Now, why did I now bring in Bagley? Because Bagley does something that most people or most cases don't do. It doesn't just give you a generalization. It now gives you the actualities of which set up the actual Brady violation. I'm going to say that one more time because I can give you Brady. I can tell you a whole bunch of stuff, but Bagley gives you clarification. Because they called it 
the clarification, the standard of review. The review starts with the prosecution held or suppressed evidence that was requested or not requested. Because if a defendant is able to establish both that the state knowingly used perjured testimony and that it failed to disclose evidence showing the falsity of the testimony, the defendant is titled to relief if he or she can show the testimony used is material under the perjured testimony line of decisions and it's more relaxed materially standard. Now, I'm going to get to the materiality standard. But understand that. The first test in doing this is to figure out if Brady was violated. Now, you ready? One, did the state use the testimony? Two, was the testimony false? Three, was the testimony knowingly used? And four, if these questions are firmly answered, now you have to come up with the context of if there's a reasonable likelihood that the false testimony could have affected the judgment to the jury. And how did I tell you figure that out? You polled the jury. Because one of the things that happened during my trial, and it was it was almost amazing because I felt I almost fell out my seat whenever he did it. I'm standing up there at the podium and I'm cross-examining the um the cop that set up pretty much all of the stuff that was as far as charging me and getting the uh, warrants or whatnot. Now, the funny thing was, my brother's attorney kept telling me, object, 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 object. And I told her, no, let him talk. Object, 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 object. Nope, let him talk. Why? Why? Because he can't now change it. So the first part of the Brady violation was if the state used the testimony. Absolutely, because he got on the stand and testified. Two, was the testimony false? I actually got him to admit that the testimony he had previously made was false. Three, whether the testimony was knowingly used. I made a request that was very specific and I stood on that specificity until the day of trial prior to the testimony so them continuing to use it was knowingly now the only part of this that doesn't matter is because i won so question number four doesn't have to be answered but it did open a door just in case i'm gonna say that one more time it doesn't matter about the likelihood of the false testimony could have affected the judgment of the jury, but it also could work in my favor because he admitted that he lied. He admitted that the testimony was false. He admitted that the um, John Melvin knew. He knew while he was on the stand. So what was I also doing? I was making sure that I had a means of coming home because I was also, at the same time, understanding that our system is very fallible. Because you remember, I just spoke about a little while ago, 106 innocent people that we knowingly murdered. State-sanctioned murder, knowing they were innocent of the crimes that they were charged of. But I also backdoored, make sure, made sure I had a little cushion just that just in case, because again, our system is fallible. Why? Because you had police making conscious decisions and lying. You had prosecutors making conscious decisions and lying. You have judges that don't care. Oh, I'm back at the Tommy Sotomayor podcast. Did you, you remember the Tommy Sotomayor question? If you don't remember, go back and listen to it. Because he asked a great question. And he gave a great statement. 
And in that statement, it allows you to think because now it goes into the dissection of what I'm doing right now. Because under Bagley, the material testimony is met and a new trial is required if there is a reasonable probability that the evidence been disclosed to defense and the result of the proceeding would have been different. Remember, under Bagley, I'm going to say that one more time. Why? Because again, while I'm speaking to you as a whole, I'm speaking to someone as an individual because again, it's the guiding point. Under Bagley, the materially the materiality test is met and a new trial is required if the reasonable probability that the evidence would have been disclosed to the defense because it was requested or should have been there and the result of the proceeding would have been different. The difference would have been Knowing the truth. Acceptance of the truth. Because even my state, Texas, has adopted the Bagley test for materiality determinations when exculpatory evidence is suppressed. Now, you ready? Because even under Bagley, the prosecution has a duty to disclose evidence that would be used to impeach the prosecution's witness. Whoops. Because what do we call that evidence? Police jiggly information. The prosecutor has a duty to disclose evidence that could be used to impeach the prosecution's witnesses. The prosecution has a duty. Why do they have that duty? Because that duty sounds as if it's fiduciary. Because they work for the people. The defense is probably part of the people. Now, here's the great part about it. Because even when the context of the detailed discovery comes in. Prosecutors also have to disclose incentives which had been offered to witness contingent on the government's satisfaction with their testimony. Now, this actually, when it came to mind, I actually started smiling because I thought about power because it's one of my favorite shows. And one of the things that they like to offer, especially someone that's in jail, is what they call transactional immunity. However, it's not worded in that means. What that means is basically you have to show up and testify truthfully. There are loopholes in that truthfully, but you also have to understand technically all you're doing is showing up and you don't lie because absence of the truth is not a lie. But when you actually give information that's false, that is lying. Now, if you're in a relationship, I'm saying the same thing. A lie and the absence of the truth, both of those are lies. But when you come to law, law only cares about itself. The absence of the truth is not a lie. But the absence of true information when asked is a lie. So when you're talking about the incentives, this is part of those requests. Those are part of those re specific requests that are not done by attorneys that you are not paying $50,000 or more. Unless you're calling your boy, because then I got you. But it's also not for free. And hell, by the end of this month, it's going to be going up again. Because we got inflation. I know you've seen these Fred rates. You got to see it. But anyway... In Bagley, the court expressed concern with any adverse effect that the prosecutor failed to respond to evidence requested might have had on the preparation of the defense's case. 
Remember, I told you hundred hours. And I'm talking about Bagley a lot right now. I'm talking about the weight that the prosecutor has to disclose primarily when requested. Because now we're talking about it's a violation if due process is violated when the prosecutor isn't disclosing specific evidence, specific requests. even incentives that they're offering to witnesses. This is something that the prosecutor must. Notice I'm not talking about... Now, I'm, I'm, I'm actually throw something out because I thought it was interesting. Because I had a young man, he, he called me for help, and then he decided he didn't want help, and then he then decided he wanted to teach me, yet he had never done anything. And then he goes... Well, one's a request and another's a demand. If I'm filling out a motion, the request is used as a demand if you use it properly. The request is a demand because if you use, if you go to an actual first edition or second edition law dictionary, there is no separation between request and demand because the request itself is the demand. When you're sending out a motion, it's informative. It's notice. It's also requesting. It's also demanding. There are no separations in no words. Those It's like using a thesaurus. Two different words mean the exact same thing in that context, because law doesn't differentiate the two in those cases. But Kyle B. Whitley, 1995, the court discussed the necessary showing to obtain a new trial when a prosecutor withholds exculpatory evidence. The showing does not require a demonstration that the disclosure of this evidence would have resulted in an acquittal. But it's like, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, Supreme. Hold on. You just said Bagley, which was in, where was Bagley at? Bagley was in 85. It didn't require an acquittal. But now you're saying Kyle V. Whitley in 95 required that it shows an acquittal. Well, again, specificity. The first context gives you the direction that it was heading in. Ten years later, it gave you a new decision. Because not whether the defendant would have more likely than not have received a different verdict with the evidence, but rather in its absence, he received a fair trial Understood as a trial resulting in a verdict worthy of confidence. Because what it then sets up is reversible error. Because you remember I talked about this. Because I talk about things that set up these, uh, uh, what do you call this, appeals. Which allows these things to be read. Because that's what a reversible error is. Because when police use eyewitnesses, where the statement is taken by police that was actually favorable to the defendant, that's part of a violation. Inconsistent statements by police informants. That's prosecutorial exculpatory evidence. A computer printout with a license plate number that doesn't match your car. Those are exculpatory evidence examples. Because knowledge of government agents, such as police officers, of 
exculpatory evidence is inputted to the prosecution. That's also Williams v. Whitley in 1991, U.S. v. Auten, A-U-T-E-N, 1980. Because I told you, the prosecutor is making a choice. I said, the prosecutor is making a conscious choice. So they have the blame when specific information is requested and not turned over because because when here's the thing and I also spoke about the young man when he told me that the Brady is not pretty much pressed or sought after but I also gave him the next context because I told him I said did you also include the number of malicious prosecution cases and when he thought of it in that context, because most people don't go after someone's licensing, you know, when they have this, they actually go after their livelihood. Now, for me, I'm from the school of Tupac. I want to kill your breathing. I want to turn you into that thing that you hate and despise the most. I want to take everything you believe you love. Because I want to become that monster. But I'm not going to allow that monster to, be, to become who I am. Because an eye for an eye, we both lose our sight. I'm willing to lose my eye to take yours. And these are the things that most people don't understand. The threats, the tactics, the things that go on where they're not willing to go through. They're not willing to get in the mud and fight. They're not willing to drag it out. They're not willing to do some of the things because of inconvenience, because of fear, because of lack of knowledge for the most part. Because I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you, give you one of my my funniest instances. I have a friend. I love him to death. But it was funny because I always tell people, everybody's a fighter until there's an opposite opponent. Everybody's strong when there's no no weight on you. When there's no oppression, there's no... Everybody's strong when there's nothing to fight. And he was one of the men, I wish this, I wish that, blah, blah, blah. And he ended up getting a parking ticket. And the funniest thing about it was when he got the parking ticket, he asked me, hey, what would you do? Hey, I said, well, shit, I don't know why you asked that because you know what I would do. And I told him, I said, hey, you need to do this and do that. He's like, all right. So he did a couple of steps. So he came back to me the next day and I said, hey, I said, you do realize that that company is not even with the state. They're not part of the police. They're a telemarketing company for the most part. I wouldn't pay him shit. And I'd actually sue him. He said, yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right. I'm finna go do this. I'm finna go do that. So a week goes by. I hadn't seen him. So he shows back up. I said, hey, what happened, man? You know, you, you ready for this paperwork? He said, no, nah, I just went ahead and paid him. I said, you paid him? How'd that work? They have no authority. They are literally a telemarketing company. Why did you pay him? Oh, well, I didn't really want to go through it. I said, but you'd rather give them money. I said, in fact, how about, I said, since you're in a giving money mood, shoot me $150. Because now if you tell me no, I said, you'd rather give a stranger $150 who ain't got shit to do with you, don't care about you, than your boy that actually love you. But, the context was he allowed his fears to take over. He allowed the idea of something happening to take over. He allowed his beliefs to appear real. And even in the context of this, the one thing going forward is knowing where you want to end up at. 
regardless of what happens in the middle, there's a beginning and there's an end. Where are you trying to get to? Where's your destination? Because that's what I'm going to ask. Because in the middle of that, you're going to be tested. Because even if you get a video game and you start playing that video game, you can't go to the next level until you beat the boss in the middle. You can't elevate to another plateau until you beat that boss in the middle. You can't go to level two without beating the boss on level one. You can't go to level three without beating the boss on level two. You have to go through something. Even I talked about the Avengers and Vision. As you get stronger in this game, your very strength will invite challenges. Are you willing to take that fight? Are you willing to stand strong? Are you willing to be put under that pressure? Because this is where we're talking about the separation. Because that prosecutor, the only thing they know are scare tactics. They're going to test you. And the one thing I always tell people just to kind of do expectation management. They're going to say some crazy shit to you. And it's funny because I've actually been in a situation where someone made a threat to me and I couldn't do nothing but laugh. And they were like, oh, what's so funny? I was like, dude, you don't beat a RICO trial where they charge you with 2,000 years and then be upset about some bullshit like that. And I was like, that's lunch money. Like, are you serious? Like, are you really serious? Because at the end of the day, damn getting in the mud. I'm willing to go wherever you're going. You go low, I'm going to go loyal. You lay down, I'm digging. Because a lot of times when they say, whenever you're chasing a fool to a grave, dig too. I've already started digging. I've already started digging. I'm waiting on you. What are you willing to do? What are you willing to go through? Who are you willing to become? Because that's the whole purpose of these podcasts. That's the whole purpose of this teaching. That's the, are you willing to take that fight? Now, I'm going to get back on subject in a second, but I want you to understand where it is I'm going with this. Because this is not for the faint of heart. This isn't for the fly-by-night people. This isn't for people that don't want to go through. This ain't for the people that, well, I gave them my paperwork and my paper. I'm going to tell you like I tell everybody else. A loaded gun on a table does nothing. It doesn't protect you. It doesn't hurt you. It's only when you aim it at where it's supposed to go is when it works. Always understand that. All I'm doing is giving you bullets for your gun. I'm telling you where to aim it. I'm even giving you how to aim it. I'm helping you perfect your craft. I'm allowing you again, because like I told you, I can go to God mode. I'm the cheat code in this. I'm giving you things that most people don't understand or even want to understand. Why? Because it brings you something that no one wants to accept. No one wants to see. No one wants to go through. Because this is where you go through something to become something. Because whenever you're going after a prosecutor for prosecutorial misconduct, because again, they're making a conscious choice. Because if a police officer has exculpatory evidence, this is the same as the prosecutor having it, and it must be turned over to the defense. The individual prosecutor has a duty to learn any favorable evidence known to others acting on the government's behalf in the case, including the police. I'm going to say that one more time because, again, I did. I gave a long soliloquy in, in the midst of going through this, right? Because knowledge of government agents, such as police officers, of exculpatory evidence is inputted to the prosecution. This is what sets up, instead of Brady violation, it sets up malicious prosecution. Now, in the midst of that, if a police officer has exculpatory evidence, this is the same 
as the prosecutor having it. Why? Because the prosecutor must be able to turn it over to the defense. And if they don't, it's a malicious prosecution. Because the individual prosecutor has a duty to learn of any favorable evidence known to others acting on the government's behalf in the case, including police. Why? Because they are making a conscious decision to prosecute you. The prosecutor has a duty to search files of other agencies. The prosecutor even has to make sure their team, which is the actual investigator, has information. The prosecutor cannot evade re Brady requirements by keeping itself ignorant of information because when you request it, the prosecutor's already made a conscious choice. Ignorance is only bliss to God, not in law. Because I, I, I'm going to throw an over at the ignorance of the law is no excuse. Because the prosecutor is required. The prosecutor has a responsibility. The prosecutor has a fiduciary duty as a mouthpiece for the people. The United States versus Hernthorn, 1991. The court held that when the government is confronted with a request, uh oh, uh oh, uh oh. Let me let me let me re, let me restart that one. Let me let me back that up. Cause hold on, let me get that yak going one more time before I want to make sure you hear this one. Yeah, the United States v. Hernthorn, 1991. The court held that when the government confronted with a request by a defendant for the personnel file of testifying officers, the government has a duty to examine those files and must disclose information favorable to the defense that meets the material standard. If the government is uncertain about the evidence, it should be submitted to the court. Either way, once you make that request in a detailed discovery, it has to make it to the courtroom. Whoops. Even something as minute as notes taken by a detective during interviews. I hope you caught that one. I hope you caught it, because that was a Kodak moment. That was one of those, if I was standing in front of you, you should have took that picture. That was the one that is going to elevate you to something else. Because even Texas courts have reversed cases based on the suppression of exculpatory evidence by the prosecution. The courts essentially follow the same reasoning as the Supreme Court in their analyzing cases. Understand that. Because reversal of conviction for suppression of exculpatory evidence arises in a very um, variety of circumstances. Because again, when we talk about the Jiglio information, it's not just going after someone's qualified immunity. But it also goes into pretty much incentives that they're offering, remember? Prior to trial, that goes under Jiglio. Kyle B. Whitley talks about the inconsistency of statements made to the police. And even Miller v. Pate, where prosecuting knowingly misrepresented information and failed to disclose the true nation of those facts. These are the things that allow, because again, these are the things that I'm speaking to love it about. These are the things that the Lovett episode is about. When you're going through these with the prosecution knowingly misrepresented facts and then fail to disclose the true nature of those facts during that trial. This allows you to find a standard to which there would have been a different outcome. It may have been because understand what different means. 
understand where a you know what let me back up one of my one of my favorite shows used to be law and order and actually the more i guess the more common one would be law and order svu and i particularly like the episodes where andre brown would be there because he was um attorney bayard ellis he did a he did a show where Mike Tyson was um um I think the show that show was called Monster's Legacy. Mike Tyson was in prison not for something he didn't do, but he was charged and then kind of just left out to dry by his attorney. And in a sense, he was overcharged. Now, where I'm talking about the difference is Mike was in prison for life in this episode, Monster's Legacy. The difference was when they introduced evidence that was known not only to just police, but it was known to the prosecutor who did not turn this evidence over. The evidence allowed for a new trial because, not that Mike would not have been sentenced to prison, but Mike would not have been sentenced to life in prison. So not that he would have been acquitted, but that he would have gotten a different verdict had that evidence been introduced. Because understanding the context of he did commit the actual crime, but he did not commit it in the means or matter that was represented by the prosecution in that case. Because non-disclosure of any deal uh, with any witness is a violation of due process. Because you remember we talked about, again, not that it's going to be acquitted, but did that person receive a fair trial, even in the context of Monster's legacy? Mike's character did not receive a fair trial. Because you remember, there, was, there were multiple steps. These are the me That's why I'm giving it to you this way. Because it allows those steps to be answered. And this also works as an example. And even when we're talking about cases, because again, this is one that came up with me, um, I think twice now, in the last, I want to say six months, Pennsylvania v. Ritchie, 1987, a defendant entitled to any exculpatory evidence in child welfare agency files. Because even when you're talking about the protection of children, it extends to the home. It still allows for religious protections because many of these these um, child protective agencies they overstep or they become quick-minded to remove a child or attempt to remove a child based on personal beliefs or personal preferences not lawful preferences because they think something should be different, they then act on their feelings, not on law. So whenever you're doing these cases, Pennsylvania v. Ritchie allows you to go into that. Now, that's not one of those for love it, but it's for one of those that are listening. Now, Banks v. Dretke. D-R-E-T-K-E. -E, it's a 2004 case. The failure of the state to disclose that it had rehearsed testimony of two witnesses used in both the guilty and penalty stage of a capital prosecution, essentially when the witness uh, denied any prior conversation with the prosecution, together with a false denial that one of the witnesses was an informant who received both money and accommodations by the state, constituted a violation of due process. Why? A disclosure of incentives. An incentive as a process or an informant 
would be the money and accommodations. Prior rehearsals, lying and not correcting the fact that they had spoken during the trial. Because it's not illegal to prep a witness, but it is illegal for that witness to say they were not prepped. Remember, the absence of the truth is not a lie. But the statement of something other than the truth is a lie. Always understand the distinction. Because even if you're doing something as a habeas corpus relief, the, mater the materiality for the purpose of the Brady Doctrine does not require a demonstration that with the undisclosed evidence that the defendant would have prevailed, but only a showing of reasonability that the evidence and the outcome would have been different. Remember that. Because just like I gave you, Monsters Legacy, SVU, Bayard Ellis, Mike Tyson. The outcome is different. This allows for habeas corpus relief. Now, one of my favorite cases, because it, it, it encompasses a wide range of things, just such as um, Jiglio, is Youngblood v. West Virginia 2006 case. Brady requires the government to disclose evidence which relates to the impeachment as well as exculpatory evidence. It applies to evidence known only to the police and not the prosecutor. Yeah, I got to take a sip of that yak. Because when you're making specific requests, the prosecutor already made a choice. The prosecutor has a duty to get that information from the police. The prosecutor has a duty to make sure that stuff is inside the courtroom even if they don't turn it over. And if they're not turning it over, are you getting a fair trial? It is violated when you ask for it and don't get it. See how everything falls right back on the people that are making the choices? When you're talking about prosecutorial discretion, when you're talking about officer discretion, they're making conscious choices. They're not following law because most of them don't know law. I'm going to say that one more time. They're not following law because most of them don't know law. So they're making a conscious choice to not follow the law. So when you're arguing with someone that's incompetent, who becomes the fool? Always understand that. When you're arguing with someone incompetent, who becomes the fool? United States v. Vaughn is a 2002 case. Exculpatory evidence includes evidence affecting witness credibility where the witness reliability is likely determinative of guilt or innocence. It's amazing how we keep coming back to the Jiglio information being specifically requested in a detailed discovery for police information. All right? Because we're talking about credibility, 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 credibility. I want you to understand something. When we're weaponizing our defense, we take aim at all evidence. We take aim at all process. We take aim at all procedures. We take aim at every step of the process. Because the ability to effectively utilize exculpatory evidence is largely dependent on the defendants obtaining timely disclosure. And once you get that contract, Contract to fight. Time is no longer your friend. There's this real popular show that's been running for a long, long, long time. It's called The First 48. 
And what they tell you, if a crime is not solved in the first 48 hours, it's probably not going to be solved. Why? Because the first 48 hours is the most imparable hours of getting a case done. Why? Because time is not your friend. Remember, you also need 100 hours. If you're doing a work week, that's two and a half weeks. Now, if you're looking at most of the actual requirements that you'll find in state statutes, they don't use two and a half weeks. They don't use even the context of 100 hours. But they use the termination of 50-hour work weeks. 10 hours a day, five days a week. Right? Seems fair enough. They give you 10 business days. Monday through Friday, don't count holidays. These are things that are not done just because. These are the hints to the things that I tell you. This is, again, the cheat code. Because when I gave you United States v. Argus, clearly established in 1976, you know, 47 years ago, the prosecution has a duty to reveal exculpatory evidence even without a specific request from the defense regardless of good or bad faith of the prosecution. And if it is not disclosed, you ready? If it's not disclosed, it is a violation of your rights. It's a malicious prosecution. It's a Brady violation. So now you can go for a twofer. But the privilege derived from the work product doctrine is not absolute. The duty to reveal material exculpatory evidence is dictated by Brady overrides the work product privilege because the tactic that they use when you make the Jiglio request is, oh, we can't turn that over because it's work product. When you do a motion to compel, there's a section which I actually specifically go into the walk around of the work product objection. Because again, this is a tactic, the work product versus Brady. The argument is the privilege derived from the work product doctrine is not absolute. And the duty to reveal material exculpatory evidence is dictated by Brady, overrides the work product privilege. And what I'm going to leave you with is my state. It's discovery. I guess you can call it rule. It's my favorite article. The one I read often. It's article 39.14. Texas Code of Criminal Procedure. Actually had to exercise it during 2020 a couple times down in Houston. Because, you know, the attorneys down there don't really like talking to, you know, the people that they work for. And definitely the prosecutor doesn't like turning over information. But it goes a little something like this. Notwithstanding any other provision of this article, the state shall disclose to the defendant any exculpatory impeachment or mitigating document item or information in the possession, custody, or control of the state that tends to negate the guilt of the defense or would tend to reduce the punishment for the offense charged. If at any time before, during, or after the trial, the state discovers any additional information, items, documents required, to be disclosed under Section 8, the state shall promptly disclose the existence of the document, item, or information to the defendant or the court. 
So even after trial, the prosecution has a fiduciary duty. I love that. To do their job because their job is not conviction. Their job is truth, law, and order. If they're working for something else, they're not working for you and they don't deserve that job. Because the one thing you shouldn't have is someone that you're paying that's bad at their job. I love you guys. Get ready because I'm getting ready to restructure the master class. I'm getting ready to restructure all of the um, YouTube tiers. So be on the lookout. We're going to keep going. We're going to keep growing. I love you. More podcasts are going to be coming. And when I drop them, they're going to be heavy. So you know what it is. Supreme.